All right, good morning. Hey, we're ready to start uh, over here at Cascadia Church. We've prayed, we've checked in, our Bibles are open to the book of Lamentations. We're in the series called Route 66, 66 books in the Bible, and every week we take this little off-ramp and explore another book of Scripture. We're going to survey the book of Lamentations today. And this is a short book, five chapters. And, you know, in my thinking, the last couple of several weeks, we've looked at books with like 60 chapters, 58 chapters. And we've, we've done that with 30 minutes. So early in the week, I was thinking five chapters, piece of cake. But I tell you what, I had to cut out so much material to make it work today. There's just so much in the book of Lamentations. So we're going to do another quick flyby. Uh, but uh, maybe during Flock Talk, we'll look at the Bible Project video. I'm going to encourage all of you to go to BibleProject.com. Take a look not only at the charts they have there, but the videos that give an overview of each book of Scripture. They are absolutely fantastic. Uh, biblically, theologically sound, excellent, excellent material. So anyway, Book of Lamentations, it's a sad book. Uh, it, and as I said a moment ago, there are five chapters. Each chapter is a poem. And it's Hebrew poetry. The words don't rhyme, but we're going to show you in just a moment what makes it poetry. But these, these poems are also like songs of mourning or a dirge or a lament. And that's why it's called Lamentations. A lament is, listen carefully, it is the sound of mourning. It is the sound of grief. Any, any noise or sound you make as you're struggling uh, is, is called a lament. And grief, the grief and mourning are two things that are woven throughout this book. It's a sad book. Grief is the emotional or cognitive or spiritual or relational response to loss. Loss will impact multiple dimensions in our lives and who we are. And in, the, in this book of Lamentations, it's a series of poems or songs, if you were to hear someone sing this book, it would be in a minor key, a key of mourning, a key of grief. And grief, as I said, is a response to loss. Loss could be you know, the death of a loved one. Uh, my little grandson is mourning this week. His cat died and he did a little funeral for his cat and he's, he's grieving. I mean, it's a little friend that he lost there. It could be, grief could be caused by a decline in health or a financial reversal, loss of a job. But for Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, for Judah... They are grieving and mourning because they lost uh, their freedom. They lost their city. They lost their temple. They've lost their land and they've been hauled off. They're about to be hauled off into captivity into a foreign country, into a place where they don't know the language, they don't know the people, they don't know the culture. So it's, it's a sad episode in the history of Judah. Now God gave the land of Israel to his people. It's the promised land, it's the inheritance for the people of Israel. And when he gave them that land, just as he was about to give them that land, he warned them, if you don't stay faithful to me, if you go off and follow other gods, other idols, I'm gonna take your land away from you and I'm gonna take you out of the land and I'm gonna send you into a foreign country and that's exactly what happened. Through the prophets, God gave them warning after warning after warning. Judgment is coming, exile is coming, and the people didn't pay attention. So we can read about those warnings in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and other places in the scriptures. So um, not only the northern ten tribes of Israel were brought into captivity by the Assyrians, but now the southern tribes taken into captivity by the Babylonians. And it's kind of like a spiritual timeout. You know when your kids misbehave, or maybe the grandkids, which they rarely do, because they're perfect. Uh, you need to give them a little timeout. 
And this is what God gave to Judah for 70 years. Judah eventually returned to the land. Israel was not able to return. They were dispersed and never returned. So judgment is about to come. Judah is about to be exiled. Jerusalem is being destroyed in this book. And there are five chapters, five sad songs that tell the story. This is what happened. So here's the theme of the book of Lamentations. Mourning. Mourning is what we do with grief. It's how we process our pain. It's how we process our grief. And in this book, there are five chapters of laments or grief songs, mourning songs. A key verse is on a bright note. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, you've sung it for many years. The Lord's acts of mercy indeed do not end. For his compassion does not fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So the high water mark, the bright spot in this whole book, in this dark book, is God's faithfulness and his compassion. Even though Judah is being punished for their consequences, he forgives them and eventually will bring them back into the land. But there is going to be a consequence for their wrongdoing. We like to summarize every book in 10 words or less. Here's the, the thrust of the book of Lamentations. It's a despairing poem or song about the destruction of Jerusalem. People still today mourn. They go to the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. You've seen them there. Some of you have been there. Some of you will be there. People still grieving, still mourning. We mentioned, I think I mentioned, maybe I didn't last week, when the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem, it was in, uh, I think, our month of September. And that day is recorded in history. Jerusalem fell again in the year 70. And the Romans had besieged Jerusalem and they waited until the anniversary date of the fall of Jerusalem by the Babylonians and they conquered Jerusalem on the same day. Just to add insult to injury. So it's a doubly painful remembrance. And I've been in Jerusalem, I've been at the wall on that day and there are thousands of people just weeping there at the Wailing Wall. And we also like to show a little cartoon. Some of you predicted, I won't say prophesied, but you got it right, that for lamentations there would be a lamb who is crying, this mourning, this crying, grieving lamb. So in the tears, you see those tears, that's what the book of Lamentation is about. Lamentations, you can also have it for a keyword. It could be tears, mourning, grief. So as I said a couple of times, there's five chapters. It's a short book. And each chapter is a separate poem or song. And it breaks down this way. Chapters 1, 2, 4, and 5 each have 22 verses. And there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So in chapters 1, 2, and 4, those chapters are what we call an acrostic. The first sentence starts with the first letter, Aleph, of the Hebrew alphabet. Second starts with Beit. Next one, next Hebrew letter. Next one, next Hebrew letter. I forgot my Hebrew alphabet. That's as far as I'm going to go. So... That's the way the first and the second and the fourth chapter goes. Notice in the third chapter, 66 verses. And so the first three verses start with Aleph. The next three verses start with Beit. And then the next three, Gimel, Hey, Wow, Zion. I think those, anyway. So that's how this book has been written out. And that's what makes it poetry that it's an acrostic, not that it rhymes or there's meter to it. That's just the way that the um, Hebrew poetry works in a variety of ways. So this first of the five poems can be entitled, Wrongdoing Creates Grief. And so that'll be the first point today. Number one is this, the first dirge, the first sad song, the song of mourning, 
is that wrongdoing creates grief. You see this verse? The Lord has caused her grief because of the multitude of her wrongdoings. Now the her in this verse is the city of Jerusalem and its inhabitants, her inhabitants collectively. So the whole city of Jerusalem and she is pictured, the city is pictured as a grieving widow. Here's the first verse in Lamentations. This kind of gets things going. How lonely sits the city that once had many people. She has become like a widow who was once great among the nations. Now notice carefully, he writes here, she sits uh, like a widow, not as a widow. It's a little bit of a difference, a little bit of a nuance there, but I think it's important to, to note it. Uh, the point here is that Jeremiah, if he was the one who wrote this book, and we think he is, he's saying that Judah's pain, Jerusalem's pain, is like unto that of a widow who has experienced deep and personal and very painful loss. And she's mourning. But Jerusalem is not mourning for the same reasons a widow would. A widow mourns because her husband has died or a widower because his wife has died. Here, Jerusalem is mourning for a different reason and Jeremiah calls out Jerusalem and he explains why this city is, is being destroyed. And this is what the city of Jerusalem says, so to speak. My heart is overturned within me. Why? For I have been very rebellious. So here we have the people of God finally acknowledging their wrongdoing, finally confessing their sin, identifying with and understanding and acknowledging and owning the reason that they are facing calamity and disaster in the moment. Later we read this in chapter 3, verse 42. We have done wrong and rebelled, and you have not pardoned. So here's, here's the thought. Israel thought that because they were God's special people, that yeah, they'll be warned about their sin, and if they do sin, God's going to be gracious and compassionate and show them favor and just kind of let it go. No, that's not going to happen. God followed through and God made sure that he kept his word. He warned his people of the consequences of their wrongdoing. He's not going to just let it go. And, and the people are kind of stunned. God, you haven't forgiven us. You haven't protected us. You haven't kept the enemies away from destroying our city. How come? You haven't pardoned us, God. Listen, God doesn't know, does not owe anybody forgiveness. He doesn't owe anybody anything. But he chooses to forgive freely when we acknowledge our wrongdoing when we acknowledge our sin, when we confess, then he will freely pardon. And he does it quickly. However, and it's illustrated throughout this book, even though you've been forgiven, there will still often be consequences for your wrongdoing. Consequences will often follow, even though you've been forgiven. It's kind of like, yeah, you know, I'll forgive you for making your bed, but you're going to sleep in it. You mess that thing up and you're going to stay there and you're going to experience this for just a while. And that was the case with Judah. Uh, the wrongdoing by those who lived in Jerusalem created for them unnecessary grief. They didn't have to be experiencing this pain. Life doesn't have to be as painful as it is for us. But here's a big warning in the book of Lamentations. If you make poor choices, you're going to pay the price. So make wise choices. Make good choices. Because there's so many consequences we experience in life that we don't have to experience. It can be avoided if we would simply make the right choice. Second idea, number two. Dirge, number two. Sad song, number two. Disloyalty kindles God's angry justice. And yes, God gets angry. Now, anger is not a sin. It's an emotion. It's a response. It's a reaction. 
But notice this, chapter 2, verse 14. This is the second song. Your prophets have seen for you worthless and deceptive visions, and they have not exposed your wrongdoing so as to restore you from captivity, but they have seen for you worthless and misleading pronouncements. So there's this deception going on, disloyalty, and I want to show it to you. It's in two dimensions in this verse. Here's the first one. One of the, the first problem for the people in Jerusalem is your prophets. They're false prophets. They're lying to you. They're not telling you the truth. And you believe their lies. You've been misled. You've been carried away. And here's the, the second problem here is your wrongdoing. The, the, the true prophets, Jeremiah and others, told the truth, they were imprisoned for doing that, thrown out, rejected for telling the truth. But the people in Jerusalem didn't have the discernment to know whether or not these prophets, real prophets, true prophets, or false prophets, whether or not they were telling the truth, and they didn't care. They didn't really want to know if their prophets were telling them the truth because, listen carefully, the lies that were put out by these false prophets freed the people in Jerusalem to pursue their own pleasures. They let the people in Jerusalem just do whatever they wanted to do. You want to worship this God? You want to be involved in that? You want to do that thing? Hey, do your own thing. It's, it's okay. Who are we to judge, right? You just do what you want to do. And we've seen before in the last couple of weeks that some of the problems here in Jerusalem at this time was these, these people were sacrificing their own children to some of these false gods. And God said, that kind of activity never even entered my mind. How did it get into yours? Of course, it's Satan. It's satanic. So God's people here in Jerusalem were just too busy enjoying their fun and their fellowship to care about, to care whether they had, their leaders were correct in what they were saying to them. Nobody seemed to care. And that's what angered God. That's what angered him. Chapter 2, verse 3. In fierce anger, he has cut off all the strength of Israel. He has pulled back his right hand from the enemy. There's two things going on in this verse as well. First of all, he cut off all the strength of Israel. All the things that made Israel unique. All the things that God gave to them as his special people. God put an end to it. He put an end to their worship. He put an end to the priesthood. He put an end to the prophets, to the kings, to the temple. It's gone. It's been taken away. These are all things that Israel had with the exception of kings that nobody else had. And God took it all away because he was angry at his people for being rebellious. And here's the second dimension of that. He has pulled back his right hand. Now, God doesn't have a body. He doesn't have physical hands. But it's... It's a figure of speech to indicate that God has been holding back Judah's enemies up to this point. He's been restraining them. But now, because the sin continues, uh, God has finally come to the point where he said, enough. I've, I've run out of patience. Judgment is coming. That brings us to chapter 3. Rebellion causes suffering. <clears throat> Rebellion causes suffering. See chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. I am the man who has, been, who has seen misery because of the rod of his wrath. God's wrath, God's anger. He has driven me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. Again, this is the consequence for sin. He's not blaming God because God did anything wrong to Judah. He didn't. God never does anything wrong. He's always right. But he warned his people of the consequences and now he's making good on his warnings. Look, I told you this was going to happen. You didn't listen, here it comes. You've got to follow through. It's a good parenting principle and grandparenting principle as well. You must follow through on, on warnings of consequence. And he said, I'm going to do this if you don't stop. And they didn't stop and he did it. 
C.S. Lewis uh, is a, was a British writer, philosopher, and he wrote one time that suffering is God's megaphone. Suffering is God's megaphone to the world. And it worked for Judah. They were suffering. And they began to listen for the voice of God. God, what are you saying to us? What do you want us to know? Now <laughs> we're listening. And here it is. Uh, they finally acknowledged that we have done wrong and rebelled. They're confessing their sin. They're confessing their wrongdoing. They realize now why they are suffering. It's our fault. It's our fault. So Judah is taking responsibility for her actions. That leads to healing. When you take responsibility for your own actions, there's no other way we're going to find healing. And so... Uh, First, before there's going to be the ultimate healing for this people, there are more consequences that must be endured. So there's, even though, okay, God, we get it. We know what we've done wrong. That's not, we're only halfway through the book. Still two more chapters. And here's chapter four, dirge number four. Sin crushes happiness. This is a very graphic chapter. He goes into some detail about the horrors in Jerusalem while the city was besieged. Those who used to eat delicacies are made to tremble in the streets. Those who were raised in crimson clothing embrace garbage heaps. It's talking about royalty, wealthy people. They've been reduced to homelessness just like everybody else. Everybody's struggling. Everybody's trying to survive. And so this is uh, illustrating what is happening so far in the city while it is besieged. Remember, to be besieged means that the enemy army surrounds the city, cuts off the water supply, cuts off the food supply, and the people inside starve to death and they dehydrate to death. In fact, you can read also in this chapter uh, that these people... Uh, resorted, resorted to cannibalism. Parents eating their own children because they're starving. They have nothing else to eat. It's terrible. It's terrible. And this siege, we learned last week, went on for 18 months before Judah finally surrendered. But in that whole time, they're suffering. They're suffering. But God has not abandoned them. They feel abandoned. They feel as though God has forgotten about them. But God is letting them suffer. God is letting them pay the consequences to face the music in a minor key, so to speak. He has heard their cries. He is going to respond to their appeal for reconciliation and restoration. And that eventually comes. So number five, the fifth song, the fifth dirge is this. Repentance brings restoration. Chapter five, verse 22 and 23. Restore us to you, Lord, so that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are exceedingly angry with us. And they're saying, God, we know that you're not going to utterly re reject us. We know that you're angry with us. We don't want you to be exceedingly angry. We don't want you to cut us off forever, but we want to be restored. Notice in the verse, restoration first begins vertically. It first begins with a relationship with God, and it has things have to be right vertically before they can ever be made right horizontally. And that's where they're saying, restore us to you so that we may be restored. There's a similar verse. There are several. But here's one in the New Testament, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. It says, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of his son, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So if we walk in the light as he is in the light, if things are right vertically, that's the foundation of the basis by which we can have horizontal relationships that are 
harmonious. So the first half of chapter 5, we're just about done here. Jeremiah is asking God to remember what happened to your people. Notice this. That's how the chapter starts. Remember, Lord, what has come upon us. Look and see our disgrace. Now, God doesn't forget anything. And Jeremiah, if he wrote it, he's not saying, God, you know, don't ever forget this. He's not going to forget it. But what he's doing, he's rehearsing his pain. <laughs> he's reminding God in that way uh, that, hey, we are hurting and we're, we're complaining, God, about our pain. We're talking to you about our situation, which is healthy. God wants to hear from Jeremiah, the people in Jerusalem. He wants to hear from us. It's okay to talk to God about your pain. It's okay to talk to God about what is not working well, what is not going well in your life, or at work, or at school, or in your marriage, or at home, or wherever it might be, in your neighborhood, in the community, in our world. It's okay to dump. If you want to just pour it out and just tell God, read the Psalms. Psalms are loaded with this kind of language. Some people are afraid, you know, I can't tell God, I shouldn't talk to him about that. Yeah, you should, it's healthy. And often, often talk to God all the time about what's going on. That's what's happening here. It's a healthy thing. They're finding solace in telling God about their pain. And it's leading them toward healing. So as I said, it's okay to tell God what bothers you, what hurts you, what is damaging you. Tell him, let him know. He wants to hear that. The second half of this final chapter, Jeremiah is asking God to restore his people. Heal us. Put us back where we want to be. Bring us home. Put us back where we belong. We've learned our lessons, God. We want to go home. We want to stay home. Here it is, 522 and 23. Restore us. We read this earlier. Restore us to you, Lord, so that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old unless you have utterly rejected us and are exceedingly angry with us. Now, this is going to happen eventually. Judah's eventually going to come back to Jerusalem. But they're going to have, like I mentioned earlier, they're going to have this time out. They're going to be sent away for 70 years. And we're going to learn about that in the books to come. What happened while Judah was in exile? So the, 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 here's, here's the deal with this book. Judah has wandered far from God. And they're struggling. But just like the prodigal, remember the, the story Jesus told about the prodigal son who wandered from his father and life got really hard for him, more difficult than it needed to be because he made a series of bad choices. Jesus told that story to illustrate for us that really the focus is not so much the son, it's the father who's waiting patiently for those who have wandered to return, to come home. That's what he wants for Judah, and they will come home. But they're going to need to kind of eat some pig food for a while, like the prodigal son did. And so uh, I talk to people often. I know people who have wandered. And listen, it might be you. God's one step away. Regardless of how far you may have wandered, He's one step away. And the way that you take the step back to him is you you admit that you were wrong. You admit that you made some poor choices. You admit that the consequences you're facing in life belong to you because of the choices that you made, that you, in essence, have earned this. That's all God wants to hear. He wants you to, the word is to confess. It means to agree with God that you failed. Either the things that you knew you should have done you didn't do or the things you knew you shouldn't do, you did it anyway. That's what God wants to hear. He wants to hear you confess. He wants you to admit it. And because God is faithful, he will forgive and restore. Here's that verse again. The Lord's acts of mercy indeed do not end. Mercy means you do not receive what you deserve. Grace means you receive what you don't deserve. The Lord's acts of mercy indeed do not end, for his compassions do not fail. God will never fail to be compassionate. They are new every morning. 
Every day is a brand new day. Every day you get a brand new opportunity to make right choices. Great, great is your faithfulness. So the takeaway for today, today is this idea that God is faithful. So uh, I know that, you know, I am guilty of making poor choices. I've got regrets in my life. You've made poor choices. You have regrets in yours. What do we do about that? Well, it's a new day. You know, you confess that. You learn from it, but turn from it. Don't do it again. And if you need to make amends, make amends. If you need to apologize or confess to somebody that you have injured or harmed, do that. It's like, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, right? That's the way Jesus taught us to pray. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for this book of Lamentations that describes not only what happened to the people of Judah so long ago, but also illustrates how life works even today on a personal level, in a marriage, in a family, in a church, in a community, in a nation, in the world, with you, with others. So God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your compassion that you understand and uh, that you are just one step away. All we need to do is say, God, it's my fault. I did it. I'm guilty. And you have promised to forgive and restore. And as 1 John 1, 9 says, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now the consequences might come, but that's how we learn to be wise. That's how we learn also to be compassionate with those who are struggling, who are currently, presently making poor decisions, and we can see it. Uh, we're not to be judgmental, but we're to be compassionate, we're to be engaged, we are to help support and encourage those to take the one step back to you. Thank you, God, for the way that you love us. Thank you that we get to learn from you this morning. Help us to live what we've learned. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's say goodbye to the folks that are watching this morning. Goodbye. Thanks for watching. <laughs>